Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, welcome to the fourth lecture of our uh, Cerita Kita series, uh, which is organized together with the special exhibition Cerita Stories, which we launched last Friday. Um, I do have to apologize for the change of venue. Uh, it's a bit last minute. We had some te technical issues in the auditorium, so please bear with us. I know it's a bit warm here. We've done our best <laughs> to try to keep it cool. Um, so yeah, if you have fans, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, please try to maintain the one meter distancing. Uh, yeah. We've tried to accommodate as many of you in here as possible. Okay. So uh, a bit more about the Trita's uh, special exhibition. So Trita shines a spotlight on the shared stories and the role of the storyteller uh, via an array of selected artifacts, signature, collaboration, signature collaborations that MEC has presented over the past decade. So including our Senusantara series where we work with the various sub-ethnic community groups. Uh, my name is Jamal, I'm Senior Manager Programs at the Metal Head Centre and I'll be moderating the session today. Um, before we begin, just some housekeeping. Um, we're still living in the shadows of COVID, so for the Q&A session, uh, especially in the slides, please, please do not shout out your questions. Uh, I know I've received some feedback that people don't like the Slido platform, but this is the best we have at the moment. So take the QR code if you have any questions or comments. Uh, I'll read it on my phone later during the Q&A session. Yeah? Um, so today's uh, session will feature three speakers who are descendants of people who identify as Orang Laut or Orang Pulau. Uh, originally, there were supposed to be four speakers, uh, including Dr. Hamza. Uh, he apologized. He is not able to join us because he's had some uh, last minute uh, Something happened. Lah. Uh, he didn't quite elaborate and I didn't want to ask, but uh, hopefully we can have him at the next session. Um, so the three speakers we have with us today are descendants of people who do identify as Orang Laut or Orang Pulau. Here I would like to state that there are some distinctions between the two groups. Um, I will not elaborate further. One of my speakers will, will elaborate more on th that particular distinction. Um, <coughs> While the history of the Orang Laut, uh, I think in Singapore particularly, had been widely researched and documented, uh, part especially in academia, um, I think more effort could be put into documenting the various narratives uh, of the community themselves, uh, the Orang Pulau's and the Orang Laut's. What are their own stories, their own personal stories, their own personal experiences? I think uh, a lot of the writing have been a bit too academic, have not been uh, accessible enough to the general public, and we hope that uh, what we are doing today uh, can reach a, a wider audience lah, so people can know more about these various communities. Um, <coughs> So, who are the Orang Pulaus? Uh, so, the Orang Pulaus of Singapore would inhabit the various islands of the Singapore mainland, islands such as Pulau Bukom uh, and Pulau Semakau in the south, uh, Pulau Uben and Pulau Tekong in the north. So, as part of our effort to identify and present heritage-based narratives of the Malay community in Singapore, uh, we are also very conscious that we must include the narrative of the Orang Laut and the Orang Pulau, who are as integral a part of Singapore's history uh, as the Bugis or Baranese or the Javanese who we have presented in past exhibitions before. Um, alas, we still need to do a lot more work in terms of our research in identifying objects and artifacts before we can present uh, these communities in an exhibition. So hope today is kind of like a, a new start because I just met these wonderful people. Um, I would like to introduce you to my first speaker, Muhammad Sharum bin Muhammad Taha. Um, he is a descendant of Orang Bidwanda Kalang. Uh, Sharum is currently a secondary school te history teacher. His interest in the local history of the Orang Laut came from the many stories he had heard from his late grandmother, who considered herself as Orang Suku Kalang. His late paternal grandfather, who ha he had never met, was from Suku Bentan. As an undergraduate at NUS, he wrote an honours thesis in 2003 on British perceptions of Orang Laut. That's always fun, right, reading British perception of us. Yeah. Uh, partly to dispel the long-held notion of the Orang Laut as pirates, uh, but mostly to satisfy his own curiosity about his past. Um, beyond school, he has been sharing his knowledge on the Orang Laut through interviews with Straits Times and documentaries by CNA and BBC. Um, he has also done sharing sessions with NUS, NUH and the US Coast Guard Academy. Okay, we're going to talk about that a bit. Uh, the US Coast Guard Academy, I need to know what happened there. <laughs> with the hope of helping more people understand indigenous communities and the challenges they face with increased modernity and urbanization. Um, my second speaker, uh, so sorry, before I go there, uh, so <coughs> Sharon will provide the context as to who the Orang Laut are, who the Orang uh, 
the orang pulau sa uh, in history through from uh, the Malay annals all the way until uh, the arrival of Raffles. So my second speaker uh, is Yan Nazira Noden. Uh, she identifies as a descendant of Orang Pulau Brani and also a co-chairman of the Pulau Brani Committee. So uh, in back in 2019, right? Was it 2019? Eh, 2016, the, the SG50 year. Right? So in SG50, uh, from 2015 to 2016, she started working on the Memories of Pulau Brani project. Uh, this is eventually became a book uh, inspired by stories of the island told to her by her mother and maternal relatives. So she began uncovering more about the life on the island and that that is often overlooked by Singaporeans on their way to Sentosa. So Pulau Brani is on the way to Sentosa. So you would see it if you, uh, either you take the ferry or the cable car, you would be able to see Pulau Brani. But not many of us know the history of Pulau Brani. Eh? So <coughs> Izian is passionate about causes that make people's lives better and is a strong advocate of the arts. If she could live on Pulau Brani for a day, she would spend it carefully navigating the narrow beams throughout Teluk Saga. I'm not sure you can go there still, right? Can you? Cannot go there already. Okay, too bad. Resting at her mother's childhood home, standing on the highest point and observing the whole island and catch a movie at the outdoor theatre with a plate of Brani-style roti john and bandung tarik. Sadly, I do not know how Brani-style roti john looks like. I, I hope you can share a bit about that later. Um, so, Izian will share a bit about the history of Pulau Brani and um, the, what life was like there once upon a time before relocation. Our final speaker, Fidaw Saini, is a descendant of Orang from Pulau Semakau and also a founder of Orang Laut SG. He's a fourth generation Orang Laut whose ancestry can be, ancestry can be traced to the Riau Islands. In 2020, Fidaw started the Orang Laut Singapore page on IG on Instagram dedicated to retelling stories of Pulau Semakau through photographs and stories from his family. He also offers traditional Orang Laut cuisine, home cooked by his mother, Madam Noraimi, at oranglaut.sg, so do check it out. He works as at an environmental non-profit and strives to bridge the gap between sustainability and island traditions. Okay, so I will not take any more of your time. I'll pass the mic over to my first speaker, Mr. Charum, still again? Assalamu alaikum. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see so many people. Uh, so as, as Jamal had mentioned, I'm a descendant of Orang Kalang and Orang Bintan on my paternal side. So today's sharing session really is about me um, and my work for, uh, for my thesis uh, on the British perceptions of Orang Laut, but also the family history, what I've heard from my grandmother, especially um, about the Orang Laut. Okay, so today's session really is about these three. Okay. These three questions that I hope I can help clarify some some things about the Orang Laut. Okay, who are the Orang Laut? Uh, their role in the maritime kingdoms of this region, uh, in the in the Riau Archipelago, and where are they now? Okay, let's let's start with the who are the Orang Laut. Okay, so if we look at anthropological studies, um, okay. So, it suggests that the human hunter-gatherer communities that depend on the sea as a livelihood have been around even before the common era. Okay, so at least 2,000 years ago. Okay, and eventually, over the centuries, we have the formations of, of uh, kingdoms. Right? Uh, Sri Vijaya came about about the 7th century. Okay, and with its capital in Palembang, which is in Sumatra. Okay, the interesting thing about Sri Vijaya is the fact that its maritime power was derived from principally the uh, Bintan Island, right? Pulau Bintan. Uh, so Sri Vijaya was kind of uh, on land, right, on Sumatra, and then the maritime prowess of this kingdom was from the Riau Islands. Uh, so if we back up a bit in terms of the geography, 
So you can see Sri Vijaya at the bottom there. Uh, Sri Vijaya was this kingdom that was very, very connected to the Chola kingdom, which is uh, on the Indian subcontinent. So it's, it's really smack in the middle of the China-India trade. And of course, if we go further westwards with the Middle East. So Sri Vijaya was actually a very important uh, trading area between the, the Indian and Chinese civilizations. So if we zoom in a little bit more, we are really looking at the Riau Archipelago, which includes Palembang, of course, and uh, Johor. Um, but principally, we are looking at these groups of islands. Right, so I'm always amazed when I look at this part of Southeast Asia, because you can see it's kind of choked with islands and reefs <laughs> and straits, right, Salat, Pulau, right? And it really brings across the idea of Tanah Ai. Where do you belong to your Tanah Ai? It's not just land, it's, it's this mm, a lot of sea. Okay. okay, so what do we see in terms of other sources about Bintan? So even the Arabs had identified Bintan as the center of power for Srivijaya's warships. Marco Polo himself, trade center for spice and other goods, principally straits produce, things like tortoise shell, right, all, all these uh, straits produce that we gathered from the straits. Uh, the Chinese sources also mention Bintan trade missions in the 14th century, and of course the Salalatus Salatin, Sejarah uh, Melayu, right, it mentions uh, Queen of Bintan who would aid Sri Tribuana, who is, of course, later on, uh, after his coronation, Sangnila Utama. Okay, so if we look at the Riau region, right, and we really talk about the Orang Laut, um, there are actually three principal groups. Okay, up north near the Andaman Islands, you have the Orang Moken or Urak Laui. And then you have the Orang Bajau in green, who mostly in the uh, southern Philippines and Borneo, Borneo Island, and right down to where Bali, Lombo is, if you know. And, but principally, when I talk about the Orang Laut today, we are talking about the Orang Negara Selat right, in just this region. Okay? But let's not forget the Moken for a while because. Can, what, the thing about the Moken and the Bajau, even today, many of them practice the traditional Orang Laut lifestyle. So you can see their kajang, right? their houseboats. They are still practicing spear fishing, for example, still collecting straits produce. And you, you can visit them, really, if you go to Indonesia, the Riau Islands, and even as you go up um, north to off Burma, off, off Thailand. Okay, so I put this here so that we have an idea of what the traditional nomadic Orang Laut must have been like right, before changes take place. Okay, so Bintan, back to Bintan. Uh, and the whole idea of Bintan as this um, center of power so let's, let's take a look at the basic economic unit of the Orang Laut. It's, it's really small communities. On land, they are called kampongs, but I suppose on, on, at sea, there's, there's no equivalent. Right? So, but they will normally organize themselves around a, a leader that they will call a Tok Batin. A Tok Batin doesn't have to be male. Yeah. So that's something that, that's quite um, different in terms of societal and the hierarchies. Okay, so then all these Orang Laos are organized along their various suku-suku or tribes or clans. Uh, there's no really direct translation and because you can actually like intermarry and, and move sukus. Okay? So each group of this suku, right, they will, they will operate in specific waters but they will cooperate with other groups. So, for example, some groups will be collecting fish. The other group will collect 
clams or oysters and then they, they can share depending on, on their relationship with each other. Okay, so I uh, forgot to mention that, that normally they will be named after islands, hence you have Suku Bintan, Suku Galang, Suku, uh, you call them Orang Brani, right? So that those Suku Brani, for example. Okay, so the interesting thing about the Orang Laut is through their way of life, because they hunt, gather, uh, they have this very intimate knowledge of the sea. I think later on, um, the other two speakers will elaborate on that. Really, really immense knowledge. Uh, things like the tides, the winds, e everything that concerns the sea, they are very knowledgeable about it. Okay? And lately, there's been studies uh, about the Bajau. They are, even their bodies have adapted to physically to their environment, allowing them to dive for longer, for example. In terms of their political allegiance, they owed their allegiance to the land kingdoms. So, for example, Srivijaya was one, of course, and later on, of course, Singapura, Malacca, Sia, and so on and so forth. So, essentially, they did not have their own kerajaan in that sense, or their own government, or their own their own leader, uh, sorry, their own sultan among the Orang Laut, they normally paid allegiance to a Raja or a Sultan. Okay, and then when um, when they pay allegiance to a particular Sultan or a Raja, they will have services rendered to the Sultan. Or it's in, in Malay, it's called Kerahan. Uh, so instead of paying taxes, right, which normally the Malays will have to pay, uh, they, they, they serve the, the royalty through Kerahan. So some of them become shipbuilders, for example, or, or become the fighting men, or some of them collect uh, foods and streets produce for the Raja or the Sultan. Okay, so this is a picture of uh, Orang Bajau. So when I was young, my grandmother told me about all the Orang Laut panglimas who can walk on the seabed, and I didn't believe her. <laughs> I was a kid, like four or five years old, and she, She's talking about uh, people walking on the seabed. Uh, I thought, well, my grandmother, surely this is a grandmother's tale. And <laughs> until I saw videos <laughs> of the Orang Bajau literally walking on the seabed. And if you think about, uh, if you dive, right, you know about buoyancy and all that, they literally can walk on uh, water. It's, it's pretty amazing. And you, if you get a chance, go to YouTube, you look out for Bajau spear fishermen and, and how they do this. Okay, so now I'm, I'm moving on a little bit about popular representations of the Orang Laut and, and very much, especially because I'm a teacher, uh, 20 years ago, the depiction of the Orang Laut normally is the Orang Sleta. These are pictures of the Orang Sleta in the early 1900s, early 20th century. Okay, so depicted in their Kajang and all that. So much so that people have this idea that Orang Laut only stay in Kajang. <laughs> which is problematic lah. Okay, because if you are going to be like uh, Sang Nila Utama's uh, warriors, right? How are you going to fight in this? Right? So, so that's, that's something that never gelled with me. So I'm, I'm going to introduce you <laughs> to some of the other Orang Laut crafts uh, which are still around today. So this is a Kolek Laya. Uh, I think later on uh, Izjan is going to talk a little bit more about that and the races that we had in the Southern Islands. Yeah? Kolek Laya, superb vessel, right? It's about uh, 45 feet long uh, at most. And this is principally a pursuit vessel by the Orang Laut when you want to chase down merchant ships, right? Or you want to make sure your enemy's warships do not enter the, the domain of your king. Okay, so from the Singapore archives, you can see how skillful they are just balancing on the uh, Kolek Lomba. I think Jamal has some stories also about being in a Kolek Lomba but not knowing how to balance himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, you can see these races still going on um, in, in uh, Batam, Belakang Padang, right, in the Riau Islands. Okay, so this was a picture from Pulau Brani as well, right, Izian? If I'm not wrong, 
but it's from the National Archives as well. So you can see. So you imagine when, when I was reading um, European reports, British, Dutch, so like 20 of them will be on the horizon, appearing on the horizon, and then you are a European merchant vessel or you are a Bugis merchant vessel. So this is what the Orang Lauts did for the king. More recently, 1905, you can see the old parliament house. Right, so really in the 20th century, the Orang Laut, Orang Pulau were still racing this in their regattas. This was New Year regatta. This time round, uh, the front sail is, is furled, so it's not unfurled yet. So they, they're about to start. Okay, so the other vessel that will give you an impression is really the Lanong, Lanchong, Lanchang, depending on the, the region you are from. So these are principally your war vessels. You have up to, you can have one, two, and but up to three deck of rowers. Typically two or three mustard. Cannons were very commonly used if, if they had purchased the cannons from the Europeans. Okay, and, and in uh, native sources, they are described as lancang bertiang tiga, three mustard ships, or even kapal perang. Right? These are not piratical vessels, despite whatever the Spanish museum says. <laughs> so <laughs> these are vessels really uh, designed for war, for raiding missions for, for the king. Okay, so the, the biggest well-known, most well-known is perhaps Mendam Berahi. Right, this is, of course, the ship by Hang Tua, uh, who is a Laksmana. I'll talk about Laksmana later on. Um, so very definitely, Hang Tua himself would have needed Orang Laut crew to man his ships. There are some, some uh, questions into Hang Tua's uh, ethnicity as well. Some people have also mentioned that he may be an Orang Laut because of his title of Laksmana. Um, but that one is, I, I'm, no, I, have a, I have to really look into that. Okay, so... How then are we going to differentiate the Orang Laut or Orang Melayu with the Orang Melayu? Okay, so, so the simplest way to differentiate is really the principal dwelling, their principal dwelling, and of course their lifestyle. The more you are at sea, the more likely you, are, you will see yourself as Orang Laut, you practice an Orang Laut lifestyle, right? And uh, of course, as you get closer and closer to land, Orang Pulau, and then those who are just dominantly on land is Orang Melayu, or Orang Melayu Dagang even, if people, the Orang Laut call them. Orang Melayu da Dagang means business, and business people, they, they stay on land, they trade with the various uh, other kingdoms as well as among themselves. Okay, so that's the Kajang, right, the, the very typical boat houses that you see and uh, that we perceive Orang Laut are always in, um, Sapau, and of course your steel houses. Okay, the other thing about the Orang Laut that is quite different from the Orang Melayu is their belief system. Very, very likely the Orang Laut are not Muslim or they, they converted to Islam quite late. Right? As, as opposed to the Melayus, Orang Melayu, right? who, who live on land. So they will have their own belief systems, uh, different spiritual uh, beliefs. Uh, so, for example, they, they still believe in some kind of creation uh, power, right? And uh, a lot of some sense of ancestral veneration, right? Uh, a lot of offerings giving given to the sea. Uh, so, so quite different from the land-based Malays. And of course, the whole idea of self-identity, identifying themselves as orang laut, you know, orang kalang, orang orang bintan, and all this. Okay, so that's, that's the principle, th those, those are the main differences. Okay, so again some pictures, just so that you have a sense of uh, Orang Laut versus Orang Pulau versus Melayu. Right, so you have the Sapau, it's still, still around today. Right? And of course this is mixing, I'll, I'll leave it here so that you can have this for a while. So it's really that division, um, specialization in terms of livelihood. 
if you read on uh, Mix Six article in 2017, also talks about uh, the orang ulu, people in the forest or in the mountains. Right, so, so the the Malays, the the orang Melayu dagang, right, are kind of like in the center of this whole collection uh, of resources. So they became the the dominant group that that uh, interacted with with the others. Right. Okay, so now we're going to look at the establishment of. Uh, maritime kingdoms and the role of orang laut uh, in that establishment. Again, yeah, this map is from the sea nomads. Again, it's the idea of tanah air. Okay, so what was their role? It was very clear that they were considered the citizens of the Sultan or subjects of the Sultan. Uh, rakyat laut. Uh, Walters in the fall of Sri Vijaya had mentioned that they were Maharaja's maritime subjects par excellence. So really, this idea that they were very loyal, they were, they, um, they were subject to the king. Right? And the interesting thing is, Sri Tri Buana, who would later on become uh, Sang Nila Utama, had married into the Queen of Bintan's family. Uh, married the daughter of the Queen of Bintan. So this actually gave Sang Nila Utama, Sri Tribuana, the, uh, a sense of, uh, he had his better men. His better men were from Bintan and he would ennoble uh, the orang-orang laut right through this Abhishekha ceremony. So this this sacred bond kind of was, was forged by Sri Tribuana while he was on Bintan, this was before he left to to found Singapore, right? So because of his wife, that connection to Bintan, and that immense naval powers that, that Bintan was supposed to possess, right? But with that connection, you actually have uh, Sri Tribuana uh, being able to to dignify the the Orang Laut at that point of time. And of course, we all know that he found a new kingdom of Singapore with with the help of his rakyat laut because he needed them to kind of carry the whole entourage from Bintan all the way to Singapore. Okay, so we all know the story as well, right? The casting of the crown. So that actually really signifies in, in Malay mythology or in, in uh, our understanding of the cosmos, that's, that's like him dumping away his Palembang title and... and and becoming the, the first king of Singapore, if you like it. Okay, and again, you see him having uh, the, his suku suku laut, and they would give service to Sang Nila Utama. Okay, so a lot of this was, was told, retold by my, my grandma, right? So, really about service to the king. Okay, and this is where you have titles given especially to the Orang Bintan uh, and the highest title is that of Laksmana which kind of is equivalent to today's Admiral like you would call Tio Chihen Laksmana Tio that kind of thing yeah. <laughs> just, just as a modern equivalent so each suku had their own roles. Uh, the Laksmana Bintan would, would lead these suku-sukus into battle. Right? You had your fighters, your rowers. Uh, you even had who cooks, uh, who collects uh, straight produce, uh, who collects the rations, right? and of course your shipbuilders. They even had, the Orang Kalang were also known to be good uh, cigarette rollers. So that's what they did also. So it's very, very... Uh, labor specialization uh, basically on top of whatever they did uh, for for their living okay so it's very clear in terms of native sources that they operated like the navy of the maritime kingdoms because the the people fighting on land they will stay on land but orang laut are the ones uh, manning the uh, crewing the ships okay and definitely they were controlling the uh, maritime trade routes for whichever rajas, 
sultans that they served. They would guide and protect friendly vessels. They were the first line of defense against enemy attacks. And of course, if uh, you had an enemy raja, enemy ship approaching, the Orang Laut was the first in their pursuit vessels to attack enemy shipping, conduct slaving, uh, attacking other settlements. Okay, and of course, including as the Europeans came, there were attacks on Europeans as well. Okay, another role that they played and was very important was the fact that they had helped uh, the dynasty, right? The, in the dynasty that stretched all the way back to Sri Tribuana from Palembang, right? As a prince of Sri Vijaya, and he, as he moved to Singapura. And there were kings after him. And then we all know about the story of Parameswara, who had, had to flee to Malacca. Uh, so how did Parameswara flee to Malacca from Singapore? Orang Laut. Because there was no KTM train uh, back then. <laughs> you, <laughs> you, need, you need to go by sea. Right? So similarly, when Malacca was sacked by the Portuguese, how did, how did the Malaccan king at that point of time move over to Johor? Actually, he didn't move straight to Johor. He actually moved to Bintan and tried to retake Malacca a couple of times, but failed. Again, the the importance of the Orang Laut in that role, as they, the the centers of power got attacked. Right? How did they escape? How did they prolong? And how they, did they continue the maritime kingdoms? Okay, so is is definitely. I'm, what I'm trying to say is, really orang, without the Orang Laut, the, the, the kingdoms wouldn't have been preserved. It would have ended, say, at Malacca, for example. So, but, but with the Orang Laut, you manage to kind of get away to fight another day. Okay, so this, I'm talking about the Orang Laut as, as raiders, uh, because as things get complicated in the Riau archipelago, you have people vying for power. Uh, so for example, in the Johor Jambi Wars, both sides were using Orang Laos to crew their ships, conduct slaving raids on each other. So this is not piratical, it's essentially a war. Right? It's, it's yeah, whether you are a war or you are a pirate. Well, eventually, it, it will be depicted by the Europeans as piratical act activity, primarily because of the taking of slaves. Uh, which actually prisoners of war, lah. but eventually these people will also serve as slaves. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the idea is that if you are fighting for a king, are you a pirate? <laughs> so that's the question you've got to ask yourself. Okay, and the, even the Dutch knew that they had to be friends with the Orang Laut. So Batavia was quite friendly to the Dutch, uh, sorry, qu quite friendly to the Orang Laut. Uh, uh, leaders or leaders who had the help of Orang Laut not so Malacca because after Malacca got sacked they all chabot to Johor right so Malacca didn't have this Orang Laut kind of friendship so if you know Malacca is a, actually a financial disaster la, for the Dutch because uh, there was just no help from the in that sense the locals Okay, so by the 17th century, you have uh, the Johor Riau Kingdom uh, and the Temenggong and Shah Banda, sometimes called Shah Banda, most often times called Temenggong, right? Uh, they were already in, uh, settling down in Singapore. Uh, the VOC also recorded uh, the Temenggong's office as a Raja Negara Selat. Okay, and you have about 10,000 fighting men that the Temenggong has under his, his charge, uh, which represented something like a quarter of uh, Johor's fighting strength. So, backed by, by these various historians. Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is, if you have 10,000 fighting men, are you a sleepy fishing village? Uh, unlikely, yeah. <laughs> right? Because these guys, like, you call and they, they come kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's dispersed, but I'm pretty sure there's, uh, it's, it's not a f sleepy fishing village. Lah. 
to say the least. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the very, very big event in, in Malay history and how it affected Orang Laut, uh, principally in the Riau Archipelago, and that is really the assassination of Sultan Mahmud II, uh, who was at that time the Sultan of Johor. So this assassination ended ended this Singapore, Malacca and Johor Daulat, the sovereignty of the king. Because Sultan Mahmud will be the last in line of that king that can trace his lineage all the way back to, Param, uh, to Parameswara and then to, to Sang Nila Utama, Sri Tribuana and Sri Vijaya. So you must remember that the Orang Laut had paid allegiance to that lineage of kings. To make it worse, it was a Laksmana of Bintan who killed the Sultan. Uh, his name is Magat Sri Rama. Okay, so when Magat Sri Rama killed Sultan Mahmud, there was a curse on the Bintan household. Right, the, the Timpa Daulat, uh, you crushed by the king's curse, sovereignty. Right, and uh, with this assassination by the Orang Laksman, uh, the Laksmana Bintan, uh, you also get you you see the orang laut no longer have this uh, central uh, person in power to kind of pay allegiance to and lead them into battle so a lot of the suku suku orang laut actually kind of disperse um, because of this catastrophic event okay so all this recorded in uh, tufar al nafis which is the bugis records as well as the hikayat siak Okay, in, in popular representation, of course, it's not about the story of the Laksmana, it's more Sultan Mahmud Mangkat di Julang, that's the more popular, uh, I would say, title of, of, of that particular event. Right, so you, you have movies in the 1960s by Kate Chris, uh, and storybooks by children, and that, that building on the left is the makam, the mausoleum for the, uh, of Sultan Mahmud, and that one is the makam of the Laksmana. Okay, so we, without the powerful center, uh, the, the Orang Laut never really regained their prominence. Okay, and the whole kingdom of Johor, Riau, Lingga would be divided because there will be many rajas vying for power so you had the orang laut also fragment fragmenting okay so you have raja kecil and so many rajas basically kind of like a local game of thrones okay and to to make it to make it even more interesting maybe this one is the second season the europeans also come right and also vying for power okay and of course let's not forget the boogies Right, with the arrival of the Europeans, the Bugis got displaced. <coughs> I think uh, Professor Fendi was had a nice talk about the Taliwang, right? Uh, Sri Watang, uh, and talking about Bugis warriors coming into this area as well, right? And the Bugis themselves will try and be uh, try and take over Malacca and get killed. Uh, but this is where you see the Bugis really get into the whole. Uh, Riau Archipelago uh, in in great numbers. Okay, uh, so eventually by 1811, uh, Sultan Mahmud the Third dies. Uh, he's from the Bendahara Dynasty. So after Mahmud the uh, Second got assassinated, power was uh, placed in the hands of the Bendahara. So Sultan Mahmud the Third is from that Bendahara line, and he passes away, which brings us to I believe uh, everyone knows this. Uh, he has two possible successors, right? Tengku Hussein Shah and Tengku Abdul Rahman. Okay, so that brings us to just nicely to the 19th century, uh, where we know the British is coming to control maritime trade, and they saw themselves surrounded by pirates, and having to civilize these very piratical natives who were like raiding each other 
and Europeans. Uh, so they, they tried to get local chiefs to cooperate. So that was one very big way like when he, they got Hussein Shah to come over uh, from, from Riau and then sign, sign the treaty. That was very convenient for Raffles. Uh, so those those who did those who did uh, work with the British were legitimized, became sultan, uh, given a house, and those who did not were branded as piratical. Okay, so you see, as 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century, the depiction of the orang laut, kind of they fell from favor, they are no longer trusted, assassinated the king. Uh, the Bugis were, were coming in to, to kind of take over their, their role as, as fighting men uh, and they were increasingly being depicted as pirates and the British increased anti-piracy campaigns to control the straits. So you have military actions, uh, the most famous of course is uh, Diana and, and Andromach with the steamships and you reports of them firing on vessels as well as settlements. Okay, but on top of that, of course, there's still negotiation, civilization, getting the Temenggong, for example, to not raid <laughs> shipping. Right? Those were some of the things they did. Uh, we come to the 1824 Dutch Treaty. So you see that even the Europeans collaborating with each other, for anti-piracy campaigns. 1824 really represented that split nah, where it was uh, confirmed right, that, that anything north of, of Singapore belonged in the British sphere of influence and then uh, anything south of Singapore was under the Dutch. Okay, so the Orang Lauts uh, and their communities had, had to adapt. Okay, in Singapore itself, you have these groups of orang laut. Okay, the orang selat, orang gelam, orang kalang, and orang seleta. Uh, where are they now? So I thought I'd, I'd give you some a lead in for Izian. So as 1824 pass, right, you get more and more uh, European intervention. Uh, so a lot of the orang laut were forced to settle. Right? They they couldn't carry out their nomadic life uh, lifestyle. Uh, so a lot of them were, were forced to settle on various various islands around Singapore. Okay, so this is Teluk Saga Pulau Berani, which later on uh, Izian will expand on. Okay, so we we have the fracture of the Johor Riau Lingga Sultanate, uh, and the orang laut is piratical, ex uh, piratical. the perception uh, has been around uh, until very lately. Uh, so if you were asked whether you are orang Melayu or orang laut, orang suku, the various suku, sometimes people, like Pai say, uh, don't want to say I orang laut. Like people think I'm a barbarian or uncivilized or like eat raw fish. <laughs> Yeah, so there's also something that the orang laut had to face. Uh, assimilation through marriage was very common uh, up till today. And uh, the role of religion, you see uh, a lot of changing practices uh, of the orang laut is also because of their conversion to mostly Islam but also to Christ Christianity. So you, you lose certain cultural traditions that uh, that is due to to the increased role of religion in these communities and of course um, national education like the idea that well, in Singapore is just basically the four CMIO right so you kind of com compartmentalize you into one particular ethnic group and lastly assimilation through resettlement which really brings us to our next two speakers Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sharum. I'd like to invite Izian. Hi, everyone. Okay. So, 
I'm Izian. Um, so my maternal side, my mum was born on Brani, and therefore her parents and the ancestors on that side are all from Brani. So. So if you could humor me, let me just set the context for this island, okay? So if you would like to like, close your eyes and just imagine, right? So um, I'm going to read like a narrative on how it might be like when you lived on the island. So meandering through wooden homes on stilts are thin planks of wood barely 15 centimeters wide known as titi. The houses are built close to each other all the way out to sea. A gentle sea breeze wafts through open doors until the evening when some islanders close their doors and windows for some privacy during the evening prayer. The kampong, Teluk Saga, is aglow with the sun setting rays. Very soon, this call to prayer will be heard. Children rush home for fear of incurring their parents' wrath. The men also make their way home balancing on planks like seasoned acrobats. After a hard day's work, or after catching up with friends at the coffee shop. In the next kampong of Masak Tima, a brisk 10 minutes walk away, barracks of neat cement houses line the area. The landscape differs, but the scurry of families preparing for dinner and evening prayers are similar. As the sun sets, the omnipresent tin smelting factory owned by the Straits Trading Company sees lesser activity as husbands and and young adults return to the comforts of their home. Some say, due to their labor-intensive work, the villages of Mas Masatima are less sociable. Right next door sits another kampong with a similar architecture, but smaller and closer to the sea. Named Spado, an amalgamation of the words spare dock, the village is closest to the Royal Army Service Corps jetty, one of the main jetties on the island. Naturally, many men from Spado worked for the RASC. Their working hours differ, so the evening hustle is slower than that of the other villagers. Instead, the flurry of activity is concentrated at the jetty, where the last batch of mainland employees and students are alighting from the ferry. At the other end of the island is Salat Sengke. The village is located one-third at sea and two-thirds on land, with the houses made of wood, like those in Teluk Saga. Salat Sengke lies in the outermost part of the island with mesmerizing views of the horizon. Night falls swiftest in this part of the island as the inhabitants' minds drift towards a possible journey to Tanjong, a nearby fishing oasis despite its treacherous waters. Right? Okay. So um, what is Brani and why is it called Brani? So the idea came about, okay, the legend is such that um, there were a lot of pirates that were attacking Singapore, right? And they actually they actually hang out, they hung out at Pulau Brani because it was a very nice sheltered water area. And so the Temenggong was asking, calling peop uh, asking people, um, who's brave enough to fight with these pirates? Who's brave enough to defend Singapore? So a few people came and a few people decided, yeah, we're brave enough and they moved to Pulau Brani. Of course, the people also came from other parts of the, uh, of the Nusantara. Yeah. So, um, even after the move back to the move to the mainland, Singapore, they continued their bravery because in 1974, um, two of three, uh, two of the three people who piloted the boat back, uh, who, which had the the pirates um, who hijacked the Laju boat in 1974, they volunteered to actually bring the pirates back. And this um, and this hijacking, these pirates actually had like, um, sorry. They, they had, okay. They had um, like machine guns and all kinds of um, explosives on board. Okay. So how did these memories of Pulau Brani project even come about, right? That's when you know at home we would, I would hear my mom say like, ah, do look at Pulau Brani, can you know? Like last time when I was on the island, and and I met other people who also heard those lines. And when we attended weddings, we kept hearing. And then you, you start to wonder what are all these and you start to question and start to know more about it, right? And that's when we launched this project um, in conjunction with the SG50 and we um, took to asking people to share their stories. 
Um, after we published the book, we had a gathering where we gave them the book, and this is the book. And we also interviewed these islanders. Um, snippets of them will be shown later. So who are these islanders? Okay, um, bear with me. The next slide will actually show a, a video done by the British Army. Just a stone's throw across the harbour from the city-state of Singapore lies Pulau Brani, the brave island. Like most of the small islands that surround Singapore, its people have always been men of the sea, Orang Laut as they are called locally. Their houses perch over the water in the traditional way, and their children grow up with the sound of the sea in their ears and the feel of its warm caress around their sturdy young bodies. They learn very early how to handle a boat and become skillful in all the ways of the sea first with toys, and then with their father's fishing boats. Okay, so where are they from? Besides, you know, the call to help um, to protect Singapore, um, they came from the Siak Regency, obviously the Riau Islands, um, Bengkales, Karimun, and then also um, the Straits of um, Malaysia, so Penang, um, all the way down, and some came as far as from Kalimantan. Yeah. So, um, Island life, what is it like? Was everyone a fisherman? Well, no. Um, so like I mentioned earlier when I was reading to you the narration, there was a tin smelting company, the factory that opened and from Straits Trading. Um, so it was the largest refinery in the world in the late 19th century and 20th century. Uh, and so um, the tin would come from Thailand, Malaysia, Australia, and then it will be um, smelted down in this factory, and then they will produce um, brani. So that's also um, kind of how some people say the modern name of Pulau Brani came about, right? So Bersi Brani. And then there's also the presence of the Royal Army Service Corps, which um, established a maritime water transport base on Brani. Okay, so um, what did the British do for the Pulau Branians? Okay, they tapped on the Orang Laut skills and they provided training to manage modern equipment. So um, those who were employed, they would actually manage the, the boats, the ferries, the LTCs, the landing um, uh, craft tanks and all that. Yeah. The British Army has established a training school for the island sailors. In a two-year course, they learn to be skilled seamen and marine engineers. There are lectures in navigation, and in the use of marine engines. And there is practical work in repairing and maintaining the water company's craft. Singapore is a military base, and because of its geographical situation, its communications must be by both land and sea. The Water Transport Company of the Royal Army Service Corps has its base on Pulau Brani, and here, it teaches local recruits to handle and repair modern mechanized boats of various types. of training at sea, practical navigation, and all the skills of good seamen who must know how to handle modern craft and keep their engines in good repair. The British Army has trained Malay instructors, who in turn pass on knowledge to the recruits in a carefully planned course of seamanship. Um, you will see two types of ferries just now, right? Um, there is one on the 
right that is actually the ferry that is used to ferry um, Pulau Branians to St. John's Islands, Pulau Belakang Mati to Jardin Steps, which is right now uh, where Harbourfront is. Um, but the one, sorry, on the left, on the right is actually a RCL. It is a rammed cargo lighter. It's only used by the RASE staff and also for major events. So let's say there's someone getting married on the island and they want to invite a lot of people from the mainland. RASE will allow this to be used. Um, how integral it was to the um, to Pulau Branians was during the move from Pulau Brani to the mainland. Lorries would actually be loaded on this RLC to Pulau Brani for them to up, uh, to load their furniture, their clothes whatsoever to the mainland. Okay, so um, this is actually the 37 company that was trained by the sorry trained by the British. Um, so the LTC Ardennes came from Britain all the way to. Uh, to Pulau Brani, train some of the um, Malayan people uh, on the island, and then after that, these people were the ones in charge of taking care of the LTCs. Okay, so what else was there? It was not only just whoever was living there, um, or the Straits Trading and the RASC. Um, some of these people who were trained in all the skills of navigating the waters and the modern technology also became master attendants. Master attendants basically took care of the ferries that um, ferried Pulau Branians to the mainland and also serviced the lighthouses. And also there were people from the mainland who chose to come to Pulau Brani to work. For example, this is the late Madam Mark. Then the opportunity uh, came up in Pulau Brani uh, because our friends there said that there were a hair salon before at Pulau Brani but it was closed. So they say, why not, uh, since your mom has a skill and she can, you know, restart her business there, why not give it a try? So my dad said, okay. So we rented a, a, a small shop house and then my mother went over to Brani to start her hair salon business. So, um, okay, so the, 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 the island is very small. It's 1.22 square kilometers. And was there only one village or how many villages were there? So just now I, I told you that there were four villages, right? So um, they are here. This is where the locations are. And so this is Telot Saga. It is the largest village on the island. And you can see the planks. This, um, there was a, there's a before picture before the government came and helped to widen the planks and then there's an after picture. So usually the Malays would stay further out in the water while the Chinese would stay closer to the shore because they own shops. And then so they, are, they, they stayed near their shops. So here is a, a snippet of how the islanders in Teluk Saga got married. <laughs> Ambil ni kahwin dekat mana? Dekat Pulau Brani, dekat rumah nenek lah. Yang lelaki dekat? Rumah dia lah sendiri. Ambil padang ni? Dia di berarak. Oh. Berarak, berarak. Berarak daripada uh, uh, padang tu terus datang rumah nenek lah. Ah. Uh, kan berarak dulu kan? Lepas tu kat rumah nenek, banyak sangat orang ke? Banyak, penuh semua. Ambil buat bangsa? Ha? Bangsa tu apa? Buat, 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 buat pelanta. Orang datang-datang oh, semua Okey, okey, okey Jadi uh -huh. lelaki masak sendiri, perempuan masak sendiri Haa uh -huh. Tak penat ke? Uh, ada tukang masak lain Oh, ada tukang masak, oh, ada tukang masak. Uh, Kira kan ada. teluk sapa satu, teluk sapa tolong lah uh, Tolong betul royong lah Tapi uh. panggil orang masak upah juga Daripada mana? Orang Berani sak sengke, ke? Orang sak sengke Selat sengke Haa, uh, orang sak sengke Mak Yang Kang tu nama dia Haa, uh, dia tukang masak Oh. Hmm, masak berapa ratus kita jemput lah ni Pasal kursi meja lah Nanti buat pinjam-pinjam tongkat Buat pelanta, berapa pelanta nak buat Untuk masak, untuk orang datang hmm. ha, Tak robo pula Tak robo, <laughs> tak robo <laughs> ha. Habis Semua ni, orang datang tolong Kutung royong orang kampung kan Nenek punya rumah kan lebih Kat laut situ kan ha, Kat laut sikit So kira kan semua kena taruh lebih kayu kan ah, untuk taruh orang. tongkat banyak-banyak lah Aku tak nanti kan robo kan <laughs> ah. Okay. Ah. <laughs> okay, so this is my grand auntie um, So she explained how you have to borrow stilts and planks To actually build extra space for the cook to cook And to put um, seat tables and seats So you can just imagine on the left side is um, How it will happen in Teluk Saga or Selat Singgi And on the right side is more towards the, the mainland area How a wedding would take place so this is um, Kampung Spido, it's all barrack style and uh, most of them work for RASC. 
and then um, this is Masatima. You can see the finances of the uh, of the Swedish trading company, and um, it is said that the waters near Masatima it's more black because of the wastewater from the factory. And lastly, it's um, Selat Sengke. So you can see, uh, they're actually bungalows and terrace houses. So their brick houses are more far apart. It's not so terrace style. And these are the next few slides are just pictures of the island. So here it's um, Tin Smelting Factory and the Spado Dock um, on the hill where the most of the British live. They live in the on land on the hill. And then you can see the view. And here, um, I put this picture here because it's so interesting that on Pulau Brani, there is a bata shop. One of the shops here is a bata shop, yeah. Uh, and facilities on the island. So there are soccer fields, there are schools, there's a community club, there's a mosque, and um, badminton, sepak takraw. Yeah. So um, we will hear from the arwah Madam Nafisa about the facilities on the brani in terms of like water and electricity. Ni apa? Uh, kemudahannya macam mana? Macam uh, elektrik? Oh, kemudahannya kurang. Nah, ya, sebab per air kita di, di tempat kampung-kampung semua belum ada air paip semua dia ambil air dalam perigi sana memang ada satu perigi besar ha, di situlah dia orang mereka ambil air di situ lampu pun tak ada lampu elektrik semua pakai lampu minyak lah yang biasa lah hmm. yang satu macam ya lah macam apa-apa kesusahan apa tak banyak lah mas Tak ada apa-apa masalah. Okay, so um, Arah Madam Nafisa was from Selat Sengke, I believe. And um, so she was talking about the time before uh, independence and when the government came to actually expand and provide electricity and um, pipe water. So it is um, important to note that for the barrack style housing in Masatima and Spado, they actually had earlier access to pipe water and electricity compared to Selat Sengke and Teluk Saga with the stilt housing. Okay, so what was done for leisure on the island, right? Um, here is uh, another part of the video. Football, which is very popular, is encouraged by the army who coach the players. They aim now at developing an island team. And there is Sepa Raga, a traditional game of the Malays, and played with much skill with a ball of plaited cane. The universal hobby on Pulau Brani is the making and racing of model sailing craft known so as So this Kodis. is a mini jong, it's not it's the big one where you can fit someone inside. It's and highly competitive sport. And there's great prestige for the winner on race day. There they go, and a stiff breeze carries them away. Well, he's out of the race. It was quite a prestigious competition, so a lot of people really took part. And um, the important thing about this is that it, you can't be in the jong, right? Because it's a small one. So you really had to maintain the equilibrium right from the start. Okay. So besides the jong competition, there is also the football club, right? So the uh, Pulau Braniians were quite famous for their soccer, and they had a club called Darul Baha Football Club. And it had its own song. Darul Baha Club di laut, hitam kuning, warna bajunya. Pasal bola, jangan disebut. So the, the Darul Baha Club was uh, very good. They actually won against Penang when they played for Singapore. And um, this is the team. So uh, this is a picture of the Singapore Amateur Football Association Championship in Division 3 um, in the 1951 league. And um, it was taken at the Marine Office Dep 
department uh, at Fullerton Building. So uh, many of them were from Darul Bahar Club. And so who were the famous soccer players? This is one of them. I'm sure some of us have heard of him. Uh, okay, and then these are just pictures of the Jong or the Collet races. Um, some of the races actually were from Pulau Brani to Pulau Belakang Mati and also involved all the other southern islands. And this is a picture of a Pulau Brani Jong where you could have men inside. Okay, so um, what else was there on the island besides all this, right? Then there was this unique thing called the open air cinema and it was really something that they loved. Uh, there were two movie timings, and then it's standard Bollywood shows, Piramli shows, and you had to pay. Uh, it was a small amount, but it was a significant amount, right? So what would the children do if they couldn't enter? They would try and figure out. They would try and go in um, through any holes in the fences, or if they knew someone, they would take advantage of that. There was also a pasar malam, so you could get like all your pasar malam food and like um, clothes or whatsoever uh, during the pasar malam. Um, which happened, if I'm not wrong, um, weekly. Okay, so what happens when it's rain, it rains, it will still go on, and then you will just run to the back where there's a zinc roof. Um, other festivals were also celebrated, which is like, for example, this, I, I believe it's a setting out of a Chinese opera. Yeah. And then, um, of course, as an, uh, for islanders, you have to do fishing, right? What do you do? You create your own bait. Um, this is an example of wooden prawns. Um, what would you do if you live in Teluk Saga and Selat Senke? You open the plank in your own house and you drop the line down. So you don't even have to go out uh, to sea. Right? And then you get some fish and then you cook it with sambal and then you eat it. Um, otherwise, they actually had really good skills of catching the different types of fishes in Tanjong um, near Selat Senke, which had really good um, pools of fish and then further out for Sotong. Um, one significant festival that happened on the island that a lot of the children loved was Christmas because there's a British presence and therefore Christmas is a huge celebration on the island and uh, Mr. Sauki would explain this. British uh, erect tent, ah, uh, we know, that is Christmas. And we waited and then part, I think uh, each household, uh, they give him, I think, four tickets, four tickets. But now she, I can't recall her, what his name, eh? He's looking after Balai Rakyat Community Centre. I can't recall his name. Then he gives tickets. That is no kelong kelong. Okay, one household. Okay, this is it. So that I remember someone they post uh, that picture. I'm the one in Tondes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one with uh, what uh, checkers uh, shirt. I'm, uh, I still remember that. I say, hey, this is me. Eh? Hey, where the water photo come from? And I post to my, my friend, my sister. Hey, where you get the photo? I don't know. <laughs> That, yeah, I remember that is we queue, we queue to to get the goodies, the goodies from them. I think I mean, I mean quite quite uh, uh, I think about five or six ten you want to take uh, and then each ten uh, you just show you take it and then you, you get you get all the goodies. And then the best part they erect uh, 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 ten I mean not ten fighting ring for the wrestling. Uh, these are the officers uh, who playing their their parts lah, no like a wrestler. <laughs> And then the best that we, 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 I I not so interested on this thing, but I know how to know what I get from the internet. <laughs> okay, so the picture that he's referring to is this one. So he's the one in the jacket at the front of the picture. Yeah. So okay, so we had a we launched the book, we gave the book away, and then we had two events to talk about it, right? And we invited some of the islanders to actually share more. Um, and this is one interesting interesting thing about um, the food on the island, the creativity and the ingenuity of some people. They're selling high bandung, no? They are using kind of... Pressure, pressure. Pressure, yeah? When, oh, sorry, I, I, I show you. <laughs> Here is uh, the, the tip. Uh, you know, the, the, one hole down there. When they dip the eye bandung, uh, so they close. You want eye bandung, then yeah. release. 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 <laughs> in one cup, okay, stop. The next one, one cup, open, then release. There is an open There is very famous for Hassan. So, that's why they, they come to Ibandu, you must go to Hassan shop. That's it, very famous. So um, with an island that's 1.22 kilometers square, um, was there a lot of issues? Who kept the peace? Right? Uh, so there was only one policeman and one penghulu there. Polis satu orang di tempat dia juga satu orangnya macam polis besar tu. Pulau besar satu orang ada polis untuk menjaga keamanan pulau tu. 
duduk di set satu gambar ni satu pulau satu polis satu ya? saja polis ah tu pelik eh <laughs> kerana semua orang bersegan bukan dengan polis dengan penghulu apa penghulu cakap mesti dengar apa gaduh besar macam mana pun nak penghulu turun habis semua ah tu besarnya kuasa penghulu ah polis pun semua mesti bekerjasama dengan penghulu penghulu satu orang polis satu orang penghulu aman damai sana tak gaduh tapi penghulu satu uh, terus saga satu, satu. Masa Timah satu Tak ada, tak ada Tak ada Semua pulau tu satu saja penghulu Oh ah, Awak nak buat rumah ke Nak beri pay rumah ke apa Masih dapat persetujuan Dan tanda tangan penghulu yep. So um, this was the penghulu For 30 years before the move uh, He was actually appointed By the Japanese during the war As the, uh, as the chief and then the British also continued to appoint him and then after the Singapore government also continued to appoint him as a penghulu so um, this is actually an interview about the move back to the, the resettlement um, on mainland Singapore okay so um, how did the Branians feel uh, it's a bit different because there was the RASC and then there was the uh, Straits Training Company right so the the views of the polar Brunians were kind of different from the other islands and he Mr. Nasrani actually shares about it here uh, comparing it with polar Brani, you look at the income level okay almost every household in polar Brani, uh, has got a what you call it a steady income from the jobs that are uh, available almost everyone uh, we, we do, they actually do not need to uh, uh, live on sustenance, uh, what sustenance uh, living, uh, like fishing and all that. It's always that they have some kind of a job. So the uh, the status uh, of the the Vanians, uh, they feel that they are a bit atasked because of this. Not 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 an ego thing, but uh, knowing that uh, they are quite stable. Uh, then you find that the 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 what you call it, the outlook towards life uh, is, is a bit different because you know that you have something to depend on the children are more or less uh, what you call it, uh, assured uh, and being very close to Singapore Island you find that the uh, Japanians uh, feel that they are a bit special okay, as compared to like, Sudo Hawaii and uh, whatever the other southern islands, islanders, especially from also the Indonesian as compared to the Indonesian islands. So you find that the Vanians, uh, uh, you find that they they, have, they, they they think that they are a little bit more special. Uh, I think that is maybe can answer that, that question about why the Vanians uh, feel that they are a bit special. Yeah. Uh, of course on the island there are different levels of income there are some who actually chose to be their own bosses so they actually had their own sampans with students and um, people who also take because they would prefer sampans rather than the bigger ferries or the RCL right so they were their own bosses and then they were also fishermen of course and um, so when the move happened right um, there was a lot of uh, sentiments about we do we really have to and most of the people who started moving were um, the three others which is Slat Sengi, Masak Tima and Spedo. The last to leave were actually Teluk Saga people. And how did they feel about it? So you can actually just see some of the anecdotal sharings here. Um, so it was very interesting because when we had the uh, sharing at National Library once, right, there was this gentleman, he was in, he, I think he's currently in his um, 80s. Uh, he said, as he took the microphone, he was very, very cute about it. He said, look, you see when I live in Teluk Saga, I jump out the window and I can swim. Now if I jump out the window, I die. Right? So that was the whole sentiment right, about moving into concrete, um, learning about taking the lift, taking the stairs, something that was not, on the, not really on the island, right? And also, um, you can't sustain yourself, you can't fish, you can't just throw a line out the window, you just can't take your boat out to sea to catch whatever fish you want. Um, you can't do a lot of things that plant your own things. So, there were challenges and the challenges were felt very well, uh, very strongly because then your money, whatever money you earn had to go towards paying bills, not only to sustain whatever you wanted for your future, right? Uh, 
perasan dan rasa uh, berlainan. Mana mana? Di mana uh, penghidupan kita di Pulau Berani itu kita uh, rasa uh, bebas. Bebas tidak ada banyak pemikiran yang kita gunakan sebab segala-galanya seperti alat api, eh, air, eh, semua ditampung oleh kerajaan British. Jadi cuma kita uh, pendapatan daripada orang tua kita itu kita belanjakan untuk kehidupan seharian. Dan uh, bila kita tinggal di Singapura di mana kita uh, duduk bersendirian itu uh, setelah British uh, kita keluar daripada jayaan British kita duduk bersendirian di Singapura dan di uh, dalam kerajaan Singapura dan di situ kita penggerakkan pemikiran kita yang luas di mana bagaimana kita nak hidup uh, dan di mana kita harus uh, gunakan pemikiran kita yang baik dan, dan macam mana kita nak menyelesaikan masalah yang akan datang yang baru yang akan datang di situ kita dapat pemikiran yang uh, terlalu berat ya, untuk kita jalankan. Okay, so um, the resettlement, right? They were they got five hundred dollars for each household and fifteen dollars for each tree. And where did they move to? It was mainly areas in Teluk Blanga, uh, Red Hill, and Teban Clementi area. So if you wanted to rent because you were not sure if you could sustain your family with by buying a house, you stayed in um, Bukit Merah Red Hill area. And if you were able to buy, you will be at Teban or uh, at Teluk Blanga. So. Um, what is it now or what was it after? It was uh, the first Navy, home to all the Singapore Navy in 1974 onwards. So um, the Branians moved out 1971 to 1976 and they were slowly already building the Navy on Pulau Brani. And then now it's also a, uh, the Brani terminal for PSA. Okay. So uh, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, these are the sources and these are the wonderful ladies. Thank you, Zian. Uh, I'd like to invite Fridaus now to give your presentation. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is Fridaus, and thank you, Zian and Sharon, for the really great sharing. Um, I am a who am I? <laughs> I'm a fourth generation on Laut, or identify as one. Uh, there are overlapping ident identities that I've actually noted within my family members. Um, we used to live on Pulau Semakau, which is one of um, the 64 southern islands. Uh, we have settled there uh, since the 1900s or so. And um, my family also has roots to the Riau Islanders. Yeah. Um, so in 1977, Thank you. In 1977, um, my family were asked to leave, and I'll go in detail after this. So this is a map of the Southern Islands, uh, as you can see. Uh, Pulau Smakau right in the middle, um, you know, and it's really near Pulau Hantu and also Pulau Ula, a lesser known uh, Pulau that you have heard of. Um, and uh, the word Smakau comes from the word Bakau, uh, Bakau meaning mangrove in Malay. And indeed, the, the island had a lot of mangroves. Uh, as you can see on the right side, uh, those are actually mangroves. And um, Pulau Smaka is made of about three parts. The top part, which is uh, the top part, which is Tanjung Romos, and the bottom, which is Tanjung. P okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this part, right, uh, which is Tanjung um, Romos, and this is Tanjung Penyalai, and this is Kampong Tengah. You can see all these dotted lines. These used to be to be houses, lah, and one of them used to be my family's house. And what is it now? Um, it is a landfill. Um, people talk about Pulau Semakau as a landfill, but actually it makes up of two islands, not one. Pulau Seking and also Pulau Semakau. And Pulau Seking, I think, um, you know, it has been completely absorbed into the island itself. Uh, thankfully, Pulau Semakau, it is still in existence, at the front part at least. Um, I will also want to talk about my real connection and, and my identity as we speak. Um, so in the 2014 or so, we, my aunt was invited to the Riau Islanders by our uh, distant relatives. Uh, it is for to dance or joget as we call it. Um, as, you, as you can see the poster here. So her name is here, Rohani. Uh, it's really tiny. 
And I think this was an opportunity for us to be really, you know, uh, get in touch with our roots and making make sure that we are able to practice our island traditions. So um, this was me and my mum on the boat, and of course these were all my relatives. At a really young age, they were taught how to you know live the island life because that's how they used to live, and currently still living. Um, so on the island itself, it is called Pulau Terong or Brinjal Island. Um, it is located um, really near Batam. So if you want to go, you know, you have to take about uh, a ferry ride and then two hours uh, boat ride in, in, in the sampan uh, to the islands. Um, but previously, before, um, you know, before in 1960s when, um, when maritime law wasn't as uh, fixed, they actually visited the island a lot of Los Macau and also the different southern islanders. Um, so in this photo, um, I think you know a lot of the traditions that we have on the Southern Islanders and Pulau Smakau, etc., uh, is very similar to what they're currently having. So this is um, a con uh, contraption that they have created. So it's made of like a wooden sticks and also an entrapment um, in a V shape. They call it jono. So to in a V shape, like a ship, um, the pointy end of the ship, right? Um, towards the end, there is a booboo -boo trap. Um, booboo -boo trap is basically an entrapment, and they will place booboo -boo trap in the middle. They basically you know, make sure that the fish would maneuver its way to the booboo -boo trap, and with that, they will pull up the booboo -boo trap. I have a video of it, but I didn't put it in the slide um, because I only have thirty minutes. So, with that, um, this is kind of teachings and learnings I'm still trying to research on, um, you know, through them as well. Um, on the right, this photo has. Um, a lot of meaning for me because this is like a, a, a pregnancy horse, right? So this pregnancy horse has different meanings um, to us. Um, firstly, you know, um, because the real islanders and also the, the, the southern islanders, some of us believe that the, the pregnancy horse can actually ward off evil and, sp and spirits, basically. So if you go to the house of a southern islander or a real islander, you will be able to see um, this seahorse being placed at the very front at the very front of the, the door or, or the window, you know, uh, for protection, basically. Um, in Singapore, uh, while we still do this, um, my grandfather and also my aunts, my uncles, they used to collect seahorse, harvest seahorse um, from the mangroves of Pulau Smakau. Um, why? Because of the demand from Singapore. So they would use it for TCM, basically. So they collect it, they would sell it by the KGs. So I'll talk about my Singapore connection now. Um, I think I would start with uh, Pulau Smakau itself, which is this very jetty it was installed when um, you know the PEP had power in Singapore um, back in the 1960s. So this jetty was really prom. Can okay. So um, yeah, so this jetty was installed in 1960s or so. It was really important to the islanders. Um, so what happened was you know. Uh, my grandfather used to tell me stories that before the installment of this jetty, when uh, Lee Kuan Yew um, was trying to, you know, buy votes for um, from the islanders itself, right? He used to carry Lee Kuan Yew on the beach of Pulau Smakau, um, you know, because he didn't want uh, his pants to get wet. And so that was the kind of narrative that he shared with me. And he was really a um, staunch supporter of Lee Kuan Yew, and he believed, you know, Lee Kuan Yew and his people like Ottoman Tuvok had and he, their vision. Um, so when 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 PAV came about, they had a, a few installments, which is, you know, the community centers, um, they installed also a, 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 post, a, a post office as well, and also, of course, the jetty. The jetty was really important because it ferried a lot of like, different individuals, and um, the, it created a lot of, like, um, tourists from mainland as well, and um, I remember a lot of my um, friends and families from the Southern Islanders, they mentioned that, you know, my grandfather would actually bring all of these tourists, most of them are Angmos, um, they would bring them to um, bird watching uh, on the southern islands, southern islands, especially in Pulau Smakau. Um, so there is this opening between Pulau Seking and Pulau Smakau. Um, you know, during like the low tide, you'll be able to see a lot of marine creatures uh, during the intertidal zone, and with that. Um, there will be a lot of like um, bird species as well. So during, uh, this is the best time for them to take photos. You know, sometimes they also hunt for these birds. Um, in this photo also, uh, this is a f this hut. Of course, this is my grandparents. I will I will share more about that later. This photo taken by the Straits Times in the nineteen in nineteen ninety nineteen nineties, I believe. Um, so 
this hut itself used to be a makeshift hut um, for the nurses. So there is a mobile clinic. The nurse would actually visit the island like uh, once a week. So anyone who needed medical treatment, they would have to queue right outside here. Um, but of course, on the island itself, they had um, their own sort of remedies. Uh, they had the, the bomos, um, the, 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 the healers as well. And, um, you know, these individuals um, make up of um, uh, midwives as well. So the midwives, um, my great-grandparents, or rather great-grandmother, used to be midwife. So she knows a lot about herbology and using a lot of the um, ingredients you can find on the island itself. Um, to remedy pregnant women post and pre-pregnancy, so using things like um, sea, uh, not sea urchin, um, gamat, uh, which is sea cucumber. Thank you, sea <laughs> cucumbers. You know, um, because we believe that it can actually uh, treat internal bleeding. So um, the connection to Singapore as well. Uh, I the Chegus of Pulau Semakau, um, they had a school which is Sekolah uh, Melayu Pulau Semakau, the only one uh, on the island. So this photo, you can see the mangroves here, it's very distinctively Pulau Semakau. And um, these teachers, they used to live in uh, the areas of Geylang. Uh, um, they would actually bring the students back to mainland Singapore to visit museums, etc. So they actually grew this connection with the islanders as well. Um, for example, my grandfather would actually uh, be, be so close to one of them uh, and he knows when he's teaching, he would bring um, lato or sea grapes to be given to the one of the teachers. Um, so lato could be mixed with um, coconut shavings, uh, sambal, etc. And they would have it as a snack during tea time. So, and and um, I think in terms of hierarchy as well, they were really well respected because they're educators, you know, uh, they're looked upon. And um, also on this jetty setting, um, they didn't have water on the island. Um, they relied on wells. Um, they had the Perigi, which is about 10 minutes away from the mainland. Um, I, I, I had the opportunity to actually visit the Perigi. Um, wasn't in a tip top condition back then, but they used a lot of like, you know, uh, rainwater for, for the Perigi. And these, for these little little plastic containers here, these are actually waters. They use it communally. Um, I think they were the only water supply was actually in Pula Bukom, which is you can see Pula Bukom right here actually. Um, Pula Bukom, of course, it was you know reclaimed as a petrochemical space, and with that there are a few infrastructure that's in place. One of it is actually water and electricity. And um, so these are my grandparents. I think um, through, through them, I was able to learn a lot from them about you know, island culture, um, what they used to do, and what kind of life they used to live. Um, in the 1977, when they were asked to leave, um, my grandparents were a little bit defiant. They said, you know, I, I don't want to go back to mainland Singapore, even though you know, they, they actually rented a space. Um, they wanted to go back to the island because he, my grandfather uh, firmly believed that the CV's air wasn't for him. Um, this is Rani bin Omar, which is my grandfather, uh, also known as uh, Tok Kane or Wak Kane. And this is Nenek Nina, uh, my grandmother. Uh, my grandfather passed away a few years ago, so um, sadly a lot of his you know, teachings I, I couldn't record um, <laughs> at this uh, point. Um, but thankfully, because of this exposure to island life, I was saw a lot of things such as uh, fishing, foraging, and the community. And um, growing up, you know, I was born in 1988, uh, and I visited the island since I was two years old, um, and I think the fishing, the fishing uh, process wasn't only about you know catching a fish, but was also looking into the techniques, understanding the tides, making sure that we're able to respect the space. Same as foraging, um, you know, utilizing the the, the the your six senses and looking into the space itself and give it ample respect. Um, and I think also I was exposed to a really closely knitted community. I think the Orang Pulau's, um, they, they really know who are the different individuals um, who owns the boat. You know, from afar, um, we be like, hey, boat supper to, like, whose boat is that? And they say, oh, that, you know, we belong to different islanders, etc. And they would like say hi, they would uh, sometimes swap fish, etc. So that was a kind of like closely knitted um, community that they had. And I got a lot of, of questions about the process of relocation, so I think um, Izan has shared a little bit of, on that, so I will also um, tap on that. I think the process of relocation for us, um, we were given a notice in 1974. So in the year 1974, you know, the um, JTC 
uh, came to the island and gave us um, a notice to say that you know, these are a few options you can actually choose to move to mainland Singapore. So one of which is actually West Coast, Teluk Blanga, um, Henderson, Bukit Merah and Taman Jurong. And my grandparents um, actually chose West uh, Teluk Blanga because they wanted to be closer to the water. And also a lot of the um, islanders as well came closer together and chose to be uh, near each other. Uh, so I think you know, Teluk Blanga was one of the chosen locations. Um, and because of that, um, that was where I grew up. And a lot of like closely knitted communities grew up there through hardships, you know, understanding um, the new life they were, they were asked, they were given basically. Um, and um, of course, you know, like what Izan has mentioned as well, uh, with the space itself, if let's say your house is on water, you won't be given any compensation. If your house, you know, um, is on land, you're given um, a, a bit of money. So um, I think my grandparents' house um, was really near the beach, so half of it was on water. Um, um, and also, they look at the trees that's running a house. If let's say the trees, some of them bears fruit, uh, you get about twenty-five or thirty dollars per tree. Um, but of course, the process of relocation doesn't include, um, my, will include, um, you know, the notion of uh, loss of space, right? So, um, just to share with you, when my mom, um, you know, moved to Singapore, her first opinion was that, how do you get food? Because they're not sure how they can actually survive uh, in, in a city state. So it took them a while, a couple of years, to really adapt into um, Singapore, mainland Singapore. Um, yeah, see, photo my grandfather like posing there, my grandmother fishing. Um, of course, you know, over the weekend, we uh, visited the island a lot. Um, so this is us, my grandmother in the middle, um, heading to um, the southern islands um, over the weekend. So um, this is basically a very typical weekend for us. Uh, we were actually on the way to Pulau Bokong to get water, basically. Um, this is when me at the very young age of two uh, visiting the island. So thankfully, you know, because of um, my grandfather's defiance of sorts, <laughs> I was able to um, really explore island life. And um, I think to this is really important to me because you know it talks about the traditions and ways of life of the Orang Pulau's. Um, I was introduced how to fish through the umang umang or the hermit crab. Um, so, so basically, it's a hermit crab. You know, you got to look for the shell. My grandmother would tell me that find a hermit crab um, on the beach of Semakau. We'll pick a few and with a lighter, we'll burn it at the end of it and make sure that it jumps out. It's hot, hot enough to jump out and you would um, use the hermit crab um, to fish. So we would use this um, hermit crab as bait and fish on the uh, jetty of Pulau Semakau. That's the way of us being introduced to fishing. And of course, you know, as, as time goes by, I learn more things. And um, I think this, some of these things are still being uh, done today as well. Um, I'll share more on that later. Um, but I, I was touch on Takap Ketam, um, basically catching of traps. How do you do that? Um, it's also understanding the different entrapments, um, what needs to be used, and what type of species you want to catch, right? For example, ketam bunga or ketam bangkang, which is the flower crabs versus uh, mud crabs. Where do you need to place your bait? Um, what kind of entrapments you need to use? Um, of the, my favorite is basically cari siput or looking for clams, right? This is basically for raging. And what we would do is we would go to our specific spot, which is a pulau hantu. Um, even now, there's a lot of clams there. Um, there's tangkap sotong. This one requires you know the an individual to actually go out at sea in the middle of the night because that's where um, the, the 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 squids would actually r r rise to the water. So um, we go out at sea using like an oil lamp. Um, so with the oil lamp, you know we place it by the side of the boat, and um, the sotong will emerge itself, and we just scoop it with a net. And manching toka. Um, so manching toka. It's, um, it's not exactly, it, the, 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 the direct translation of toka is parrotfish, but it's not only parrotfish that we fish for, it's basically coral fishes. So, um, munching toka would require you to, you know, park your boat, dock your boat um, really near to coral reefs at the end of it, uh, where all the fishes are. La. And uh, of course, um, munching laut, which is deep sea fishing, um, this one you require a little bit more about, you know, in-depth knowledge of the sea, uh, where is your lobok? Um, lobok means where the fish is situated, etc. And also looking into the currents. So looking at the wind um, currents and, and also whether or not the weather permits. La. So a lot of times when I go out fishing, it's always about intuition. 
um, I think the orang pulau are people that I know of they are very intuitive in terms of like where they should go and whether or not this space could grant them the, the, the kind of uh, fish that they want you know it's always very intuitive and, and very respectful of the way they, 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 they do things and of course Bekarang so what is Bekarang? Um, Bekarang comes the word coral um, and this is the act of foraging or intertidal zones so, you know, this is very seasonal, right? Because, you know, you need to have really, really low tides. Um, sometimes monsoon season, no low tides at all. So you cannot uh, do foraging. Um, most of the time, you have to forage in the middle of the sea. So you've got to wait, you know, a really good time. Actually, March is a really great time to actually berkarang. Um, so we would find something like the siput ranga or the spider conch. Uh, this is, you know, really delicious. What we need to do is just boil it with seawater and eat it as it is. Um, what we love is actually the roll. It's orangey in color, really sweet and delicious. Um, but of course, you can cook it in other ways like sambal, etc. Um, yeah, so photo of my grandmother eating, I think they were eating sea cucumbers, I believe. Um, yeah, so I wanted to also bring you guys into this space that I was granted <laughs> to. Um, you know, looking into foraging, right, it was a really special time for me because you're able to be exposed to a space where no one else exists and then looking into, you know, just new nature and the space as well. And what your grandmother would tell you is that to be really aware of the surroundings, uh, to be respectful, um, because there are n things that are known, right? It could be in the spiritual sense. Um, at the same time, also looking into sea creatures such as the um, stonefish. You, need, you cannot step on it. If not, you get poisoned. And, you know, that, that goes in a problem altogether. Um, I also want to touch on like the very significant um, in f types of seafood that we eat, um, which is the puffer fish. So puffer fish, you know, is widely known as a fugu. The Japanese eat it, um, but actually, it's not only the Southern Islanders, um, but it's actually throughout the Nusantara. If you look into, you know, um, Sabah as well, they do eat puffer fish, um, and we know how to depoison the puffer fish. So the, the depoisoning of puffer fish takes a lot of effort. Um, to catch one is actually very difficult because you have to get a boo boo trap um, and you need to find a, a very skillful man to place it at the right location and with ample experience and they would do you know, free diving um, make sure that they have the boo boo trap um, go into underwater and place it place a few rocks make sure it doesn't move etc so all of that during free driving, diving and that's how you get a parfish with about two weeks or so and I'll show you a little bit of images I have, um, just a little bit of warning, it's a little bit graphic. Um, so these are the intestines, gills and liver that we consume, um, minus the skin. Um, side note, the skin was actually used um, by my uncles and aunts right, as a drum, so they would actually stretch it out, oil it really nicely, and when they were younger, they would actually use it as a drum, uh, as a, not a musical instrument like, like a play toy. Uh, play thing basically. So um, what we would do is we will, you know, cut up the ikan buntal, a puffer fish, and we would take the innards, which is the intestines here. But the intestines doesn't look like this. This is basically braided. Um, why is braided? Uh, because we do when we boil it, when we double boil it, we don't want it to break. So there is a technique to actually braid it. Um, and the intestine is really, really long. So the gills are cleaned off, and also what makes the dish is actually the liver. Uh, the liver is known to be really fatty, but we actually use it as the base for the dish. Yeah, and of course the deep poisoning part, um, there is one particular location whereby you need to cut off that part um, at, or you could look out for really tiny transparent bits of poison and of course with the poison parts, um, there are the pantang larangs that comes with it, you know, um, you cannot um, eat it at a certain time, um, you know, when you eat it you cannot drink coffee or you cannot eat certain fruits etc, um, you might die, so it comes with all of these rules lah. Yeah, so it will look something like this. Um, they call it the karabu because there's a lot of drying involved. Um, and it comes with like uh, kangkong as well. You can't see the kangkong is hidden in the dish. And I think to really recap, um, can we keep the jiwa laut or the spirit of the sea alive in this modern world? Um, you know, through the work that I do, I hope that we were able to do so, especially with like individuals such as Izian, Sharum, and also uh, one from one who journal there. Um, I think you know we want to be able to make sure that our traditions have been kept alive um, through other whatever research and also documentation that we have. Um, so I think cultural preservation is really important. Um, we want to be able to, we should acknowledge that there are impacted communities um, because of this location.
no displacement, not dislocation, <laughs> because of displacement, right? Um, we need to acknowledge that, um, and how are they being impacted? And we need to recognize, document, and share a lot of our lost narratives, and, and to be included into Singapore's narrative as well. And um, we need to support ground out initiatives in the community, uh, making sure that you know the, these voices are being heard, and uh, recognize the sea as a living space to practice our island traditions. Um, with that said, you know we need to also understand the needs of the indigenous voices, um, meaning you know. If let's say these specific uh, rules may affect them, for example, you know, um, we need to hear them out, uh, make sure that their traditions are still being kept alive or can be kept alive. Um, also, for example, you know, um, indigenous voices needs to have a say in land and sea developments, as you can see a lot of the times. Um, for example, um, Pulau Smakau turned into a land uh, landfill, um, and and. Um, I think a lot of the developments that happen from the, on the other southern islanders as well. I think we need to have a say, and what would uh, that should matter as well. Our voice should matter, and um, we need to include oral narratives as part of formal education because these narratives are really important. Um, making sure that the orang pulau stories are being kept alive, like what Jamal has mentioned, that is a little bit under research. Um, I think it's great that you know. Lastly, if you could build an avenue for more communities to share the narratives and bringing forth a lot of different individuals, younger individuals to share their connections, um, you know, acknowledging that uh, the orang laut or orang pulau roots are you know part of Singapore's narrative. And um, I think Jamal has, sorry not Jamal, Sharam has uh, briefly mentioned that the kind of stigma that they face for the Orang Pulau communities when they first move to Singapore, you know, they are lesser, they are backward, you know, barbarians in your own words. <laughs> so I think um, these kind of things we need to change narrative a little bit and we need to take pride on uh, our history and where we come from. Yeah, with that note, um, if you like our sharing, um, please follow Orang Laut Actually, This is basically the page I manage, um, but of course they do have um, individual works on their own. Um, you may reach out to them individually as well. And thank you. Two. Okay. Um, thank you, Fidoz. Can I invite all the speakers to join me on stage for the Q&A? Okay, like not really a stage. La. Okay, thank you guys for staying. Um, I, I hope you got comfortable enough and you enjoyed the sharing. Um, I'll just summarize a bit before we go on to the Q&A. Push it up. Um, okay, so this is the QR code again. If you have any questions, uh, do scan it uh, and drop your questions on the Spotify platform and I'll read it to our speakers today. Um, so, Sharon provided a context as to who the Orang Laos and who the Orang Pulau were, how far in our history it goes back to. I think uh, he went back as far as uh, 1299 with Sang Nila Utama or Sri Tui Buana, uh, all the way until um, the disintegration of the Johor the Joho Riau Sultanate um, and how the kingdoms eventually lost the support uh, with of the Orang Laos due to this fragmentation. Uh, that segued into Izia's sharing or the experience of life on Pulau Brani, um, how the community there adapted during the colonial period and, and somewhat thrived by working with the British either in the tin uh, processing, uh, processing factory as well as uh, the Navy. Right? Uh, I also really enjoyed the sharing on the recreational life on the island, the uh, the collet races as well as the open air cinema. I remember going to an open air cinema as a child. I was very young. I didn't remember what movie it was, lah. But yeah, it, w it was quite fun back in those days. And finally, Fidawas shared about traditional activities uh, and practices on Pulau Semakau, uh, as well as uh, the the deep knowledge that islanders and Orang Laut have on their flora and fauna. Uh, you know, things like fishing and trappings and foraging. I think this is very important. Uh, <coughs> for us to know even today because I think you know, just as recently as the Chinese New Year holidays there was a, a report of families going to uh, the beach uh, foraging and uh, they, they were stopped I think it was all over Facebook and uh, this kind of awareness this kind of knowledge uh, as, as city dwellers today we, we forget a lot of it we forget that you know we go to the beach we are intruding into another ecosystem when we take a fish out of water we, we are affecting that particular ecosystem so uh, I think that those kinds of knowledge are very important for us to be reminded of. So I'm very happy that you, you mentioned that as well. Um, so let's go jump straight into the questions. 
Oh, got quite a lot already. <laughs> um, okay, first question. I think uh, all, all three of you can, can choose to answer this. Would relocation be much more difficult for Orang Pulau or Orang Laut if it happened now? Do any of them still harbor regrets or are happy they moved at that time uh, versus now? So I, th I think maybe imagine if we had to move now, la, if we're islanders now, you know, what, what would the reactions be? Any, any takers? Isian? Hello? Okay. Um, so on Pulau Brani, right, there were no vehicles. Oh, there were maybe, the British had them, um, but the islanders didn't really have any vehicles. So you walk from one end to another end, or you took a sampan from one kampong to another kampong. So imagine if you go to mainland, just trying to adapt to uh, private hire cars, taxis, buses, just the MRT itself and the height of the tunnel. Um, I think it would be really, really scary. Um, the fact that you can't just throw a line out and fish for whatever fish there is there, but you had to go to the market and now fish is so expensive, right? If you imagine all this, if, if my family were to move to the mainland now, I think we would really be set back by the high cost of living. Um, also, the adapting to the the different different ways uh, HDB formations, um, how you have to go to a supermarket and there was there's no pasar malam, very rare now, um, and cinemas are enclosed spaces. There's no freedom. It's essentially, you are giving up that freedom, the air of freedom, for the enclosed space that now you call you would call home. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> no, I think I totally agree. Uh, you know, looking into the cost of living um, is one thing, but also, um, to me, it's not only that, but also the loss of tradition. Um, when you lose a space, we lose so many things. Um, looking into, you know, the livelihoods that they, they have, um, it's very uh, closely related to the sea. So once we lose a land, uh, sorry, can you hear me? When you lose um, land space, you lose a lot of the traditions and um, you know, we are not able to practice our land tradition. So as um, a very good depiction of, of how it looks like right now is actually West Coast Park or how it used to be called Pasir Panjang. You know, West Coast Park, there's only one little slither of sand left on uh, the original beach and is dedicated to the Orang Pulau who so are still going out to sea actively. So there is a visual representation of uh, the islanders which I think is a little bit sad. Uh, if you could have the islands back, that would be fantastic. Um, but you know, we need to be able to make sure that these island traditions are being kept alive. So um, to answer your question, I'll be miserable uh, if you <laughs> would be asked to <laughs> come back to Singapore when at this stage and with this knowledge, right, um, we need to be able to fight for whatever traditions we have left, basically. All right. Th th thank you. Um, actually, you don't have to live on an island. Uh. My, my grandmother lived in, in several kampongs throughout Singapore. They relocated a few times and the last kampong was Changi Winglong. So when she moved to a flat, you know, till the day she died, she still cannot climb an escalator. You know, she never got used to lifts, so we, she always lived on the second floor, third floor. Um, yeah, so, and another example I could think of is, um, a friend of mine stayed overseas for a couple of years, came back, took the train, don't know how to buy the, the cut. Yeah, so imagine living on an island where you don't have any of these facilities and suddenly you're, you're bombarded by everything that is facilities, you know, it, it must be very scary. Yeah. Okay, moving on. This one a bit, wow, this one a bit heavy, yeah? In determining the identity of the Malays or Malayness, what are some determinants for Orang Laut? Perhaps aspects of language, religion, social culture and so on. Um, I think you, you mentioned something about the difference between an Orang Laut and uh, Orang Melayu. Mm. Right? So yeah. the question is, how do you determine the, the identity? Yeah, what's the uh, determinants? Really the main difference is the, the lifestyle the, uh, and how the suku-suku uh, Orang Laut go about their livelihood. Uh, that that really intimate knowledge of the sea uh, and being dependent on the sea, uh, and there's a whole uh, belief system that that, that actually uh, centers around the sea. So, so I would say that's the main difference. Uh, uh, and of course, there's linguistic differences as well, uh, where definitely uh, in the past, like even Munshi Abdullah in, uh, in his in his uh, book, right, he was talking about uh, the Orang Laut has a different language, uh, which is slightly different. Uh, even among the Orang Laut, so for example, the Orang Seleta and the Orang Kalang, Orang Gelam uh, had slightly different dialects uh, according to the suku. Yeah. 
So there will be differences, and and it's obvious enough for the Malays and the orang laut to kind of differentiate themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I think so. Anybody else? Anything to add? Yeah. Okay. I think Asnida, if she was here, she would have shared that. Uh, you know, when she did the performance as part of Writers Fest, Asnida, uh, she did this performance where she used orang I, the island dialect uh, in her performance, which was. Actually, some of the words I've never heard before, lah. So yeah. yeah, I think it's completely alien to me if I went to and that sing song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the 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 tonations as well are very very different from different uh, islanders. Okay, hmm. Do most of the Bani Islanders know how to swim at the time? I I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for Telok Saga <laughs> and Selat Sangke, I think everyone roughly knew because you were always so close to the water. Um, yeah, I would say yes. Um, even there are some people like from the main land who will come to learn, you know, from their friends who are from in living in Brani. Um, the but they were still afraid of the water, okay, no doubt because of the waves and and the storms. Um, so like imagine taking a sampan from Singapore, from Pulau Brani to Singapore. Sometimes the water is quite strong, the currents are quite strong. So they will also be very scared if you are a school kid, with your textbooks and all that. So I've heard the stories of. Um, them falling into the water, their boats all got wet, and then that's a legit excuse to tell your teachers that right, when you <laughs> enter the mainland. Yeah, and then also like for for Selat Sangi and Teluk Saga, if you actually run the along the planks, then you miss your step and you fall down. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, one of the games that the kids actually like to play um, is when the British people came for holidays over the weekends or any any holidays. They would throw money into the water, and then the kids would be so happy. They would they would dive down and pick up the coins and say, "Oh, sir, sir, I have twenty cent or fifty cent." Then they get to keep it. Yeah. So I think the sea, if you don't know how to swim, then it's a bit quite sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Next question. Would you believe that rules and regulations? I think maybe do you believe that rules and regulations in modern urban Singapore has left an impact to the indigenous practices of the Orang Laut and Orang Pulau? I, I can take that. <laughs> um, I think I would say yes, um, because you know, based on the kind of uh, narratives that are being shared to me by the Orang Pulau's, uh, people who are, who are still actively going out to sea, um, there are a lot of res restrictions, and there's this fear of um, the authorities. You know, they don't know what to do or whether they can go to this space. Are they near enough to, to Pulau Sudong, for example, because there's a few kilometers you cannot actually um, enter, right? So uh, the word the word is marine um, or basically, basically um, marine police they are afraid of. Um, I think there's this fear that they don't want to, you know, go against the government. So, But they, at the same time, they still want to, you know, keep up the island traditions, right? They, they do what they do best. Um, I would say yes, and of course, you know, looking into foraging, um, like what Jamal has mentioned recently, um, if let's say a lot of these activities are still happening in, in Changi Beach or any beaches in Singapore, um, I think the authorities have to step in to say that, hey, we need to protect the wildlife and uh, we need to maybe introduce a white state ban. And that is problematic to us because this uh, makes up our tradition, right? I think foraging is important, um, not only to the Southern Islanders, but also to mainland Singaporeans, mainland Malays who used to live by um, the water in Singapore as well. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to chip in with um, experiences from uh, the Orang Seleta uh, in the northern coast of Singapore. So um, the Orang Seleta were originally on both sides of the straits, right? On on the coast of Johor as well as on Singapore. Um, but somewhere in the 80s, they started to pretty much move more towards the Johor side, um, having allegiance to to the Johor King. Uh, and at first, they were still able to forage on Singapore's northern shores. For example, for crab at Sungai Bulo, uh, they even catch uh, crocodile and and, uh, and and have them for satay, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, increasingly, especially after Mas Selamat, uh, the borders harden uh, in the sense that a lot more patrols. You even have uh, barriers set up uh, at sea, so this really kind of limits the range la, where they can uh, earn their livelihood. Uh, and then I, I go to to uh, the sharing just now. If you was talking about his connections to to Riau, to to essentially, 
this place is broken up into three separate spheres, right? There's Singapore, which is the smallest. So right now, even the orang laut want to go out, so like you said, like there's a lot of restrictions. You can't go here, you can't go there, you can't go near Bukom, 100 meters from Bukom, that sort of stuff. But in the past, it was so much more free. Uh, going for Jogit at Riau, you know? And, uh, and you, you hear stories of this, of this free uh, lifestyle. <laughs> so, so really, definitely, there's, there's this impact of restriction. Uh, yeah. I think it's obvious that there's impact because there's no more orang laut um, in Singapore like who, who really practice the traditional way of life. Uh, obviously, they're gone. They're completely gone. Even the islanders are gone. Uh, our islands are landfills, or refineries, live firing areas. So yeah, um, the Kong is a military camp. Uh, and and Pulau so Brani is going to be another fun fair. Oh yay! Yeah. Another Santosa. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Yeah, they're they're emptying out <laughs> the the police coast guard from that. Yeah. Area. So oh the Brani yeah. terminal will move to Tuas. The police coast guard will move out, and then there's a Santosa Brani development in oh plan. Oh Yeah. Okay. An so there'll be another like gardens by the bay, if I'm not wrong, and then there's going to be another theme park there. Ah. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll see. Um, okay, this one is quite, quite a tough one. What are the challenges in researching and documenting the legacies of Orang Laut and Orang Pulau that the generations are dying out? Yeah, so this is directly linked to what you guys are doing, right? Yeah. Can I go first? My biggest challenge is the Orang Laut themselves didn't write down stuff. <laughs> because somehow uh, writing wasn't a big thing. So I always say I don't want to get my books wet on my kajang, right? So <laughs> there's very little time to write, and uh, there's really no no records by orang laut themselves. So we have to depend on other uh, other sources, the Bugis, the, the orang Sia, orang Melayu, and of course the Europeans. Um, so uh, so when we approach uh, these sources, of course they have their biases, uh, and then we have to to kind of um, look at also our oral traditions and, and, and remember the stories that were passed down. Um, so yeah, so increasingly these this oral traditions is, is getting lost. Uh. So th I think, to me, that's the, the biggest challenge I face. Yeah. I think oral traditions also have its biasness. Um, so you could tell me a story about your time on the Masat Tima area, but someone else can tell me the story about the same area, but it's differing. So who do you believe in? Who do you actually um, adapt from? Who, who do you actually listen to, right? Uh, so when we were doing the Memories of Pulau Brani project, right, um, it was really hard to actually make sure that these people were good representations of their village or a certain activity that we wanted to know about. Um, of course, we don't discount their narrations because those are their memories, these are what they remember. Um, we even had interviews where they were just buoyed by emotion, so they would break down just remembering their time on Brani. Um, and then you would actually have two hour recordings with someone and then you replay and you go like, was it really true? And then you start asking other people. So for myself, um, my family, my mom and my grandparents, they were not really true narrators. They didn't really have much stories to tell. So I had to go further out and just do a call out for information, for stories, for, for just any memory. Um, so these islanders, like I would say like some of the pul orang, lao, orang, orang Pulau, they, they don't value the idea of their history until it's too late, I feel sometimes, then we start struggling and like our generation says, can you please tell me more about this, tell me more about that, and we just scurry to find all this information. And that becomes our, our, our oral history. Yeah, and whether it's um, really true, like for example, when you go out to sea, you would actually, um, if there's a monsoon, you put a naked person out there because the the lady of the the sea spirit is a lady, and then the naked man will appease the sea spirit. How true is that? We don't know, right? Yeah, but that's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, really I agree with the sentiments. Um, history has always been written for us and not by us. I think that is you know the very core of it. And my personal challenge is making sure they're able to just share. Um, I think we really do not 
take into consideration, right, the trauma that they feel, you know, like they're crying, etc. They have to relieve this trauma and to share all these narratives because um, displacement is not an easy topic, right? You need to talk about your past and how you felt and, and, and also looking into, like, you know, what kind of, like, memories you, are, you have left and what you were taught. And it's not only about, you know, oral histories, also about beliefs that makes up a culture and tradition, your spiritual beliefs and who are the protectors of the space. You know, this makes up um, every part of your tradition, which I think is really important. So I need to really approach the topic very sensibly. Like, I need to tell them, hey, I need you to share with me the mantra that you know. I can't just approach it like, show me your mantra, right? You know, you have to really build rapport and make sure that they believe you and this is basically just for documentation. And of course, a lot of them want this kind of knowledge to die with them because um, there's also the social stigma uh, between um, the Malays of today and the Orang Pulau's then um, because of the overlap in religion, right? Um, whatever they, they know then, um, a lot of the tr uh, island beliefs are perceived to be very un-Islamic in today's sense. So they, they really suppress that part of that, you know, the ident identity, right? Not only them being Orang Pulau, but also the, the whatever they were taught by their grandparents, etc. Um, which I think is really important, it makes our religion. So, um, religion has a part to play in, in, you know, in all of this and we need to be able to factor that in. I think, um, thank you for your answers. I think from the museum, from the museum side, it's, it's also objects. Uh, how, what objects do we identify that belong to Orang Pulau and Orang, Orang Laut and how do we present them, you see? And because if, if, those, if the sites no longer exist, how can we find <laughs> materials from those sites? Uh, so that is another challenge. So, you know, we, we have to re look at either overseas loans or re refa refabricate things, you know, by that time it's, that it's not authentic already. La. So that's another level of challenge. Um, Plus okay. a lot of the stuff are biodegradable. Yes, stuff yes, yes, yes. <laughs> very eco-friendly. Very, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I'd just like to ask, we're, we're ri overrunning a bit, there's still quite a lot of questions. You guys okay to stay a bit longer? Okay, uh? all right, cool. Um, this one very fun. Uh, are there any myths or cerita hantu, ghost stories, that are specific to Orang Laut and or Orang Pulau that are distinct from that of Orang Melayu. You got your own version of Puntiana? Or not? They're just Puntiana. Just Puntiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any, any ghost stories or? I mean, there's many lah, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know, you guys want to share first or I can go? <laughs> um, I think it's also very island specific, right? Or space specific. Um, just particularly in Pulau Semakau, um, they always believe that it's protector. Actually, the Tanjung Romo, Tanjung Pengalai, and Kampung Tengah, there are three different protectors, three different beings. And at the back of the mangrove, right, there is this lone crocodile. Um, they believe the crocodile is not a crocodile, but it's also, also like, you know, a being that takes up the shape of a crocodile that protects a space. You know, do not disturb it, it doesn't disturb you, things like that, right? And also, of course, you know, there's a collective narrative that are being shared, like the Bunians and the Orang Bunians, which I think is very common in Malay folklore. Um, you know, during uh, I think for the islanders, right, they believe that it's this specific place that you could actually go to to offer the bunian something in, um, to get something in return. Um, it is very um, distinct when it comes to weddings. So they will give offerings, and um, for weddings, they would actually um, with the offerings that they give, right, do in return they will get um, very nice uh, plates, you know, for the weddings, lah. Um, but of course, when you want to return to them. Um, you cannot break any of that, you cannot lie to them, you must make sure that you appease them uh, or, or really, really well. Um, so these are kind of stories that we, we hear from different individuals of different bu um, Bunian encounters. Sorry, when you hold a wedding, you get your plates from the Orang Bunian? Yeah, that was what I, I was told in this narrative. Is, is this rental or how? Uh, rental is, that, is, is rental. a form of payment? If, yeah, there's a problem is the pengeras, la, don't there's some ah, rituals okay. with it. And there's only a specific few can actually go and collect it. Um, not everyone can actually just go to the Bunyan, um, and and yeah. So there's this connection with the other world <laughs> that they had, you know. Um, and also, if let's say you, in a way, offend them, the plates will break all together at once, you know, into half. That's how you. That's how they know that the Bunyans are mad, and you go to appease them for them more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's very exciting. Yeah. I don't think we have like the equivalent of Puntiana. A lot of it is like the spirits that guard the various waterways. Oh, okay. And so uh, so appeasing these spirits. Sea guardians. Sea and guardians. Yeah, okay. yeah, penjaga. Okay. Oh, but there was a penabok on Pulau Brani. Uh, What's a penabok? Uh, 
is a monster, okay. a hantu monster. So it's a story that the adults would tell their kids so that they won't hang out too late. Um, so it's like, I, I believe it's when you walk from Selat Sengke to Teluk Saga, you will pass by like certain very quiet areas, marsh, uh, I mean um, forested areas. And then they will always, the kids would challenge themselves to run through because they'll be scared because uh, the parents will say, later the penobo come and take you. Yeah, so that's the only thing I know. Okay, la, I mean, in, in, in Malay uh, cosmology, it's, it's always fascinating that a lot of the ghosts are you know, warnings to not do something stupid. Uh, right, pretty much. Uh, okay, how are the gender roles uh, in Orang Laut community like? Uh, is it equal gender roles or the different genders have their diff different functions perhaps? Okay, I, I think because just earlier I, I mentioned that um, Orang Laut women are also equally adept at, at, at fishing, at, mm. at even piloting the boats. Uh, so. Um, in traditional orang laut society, it's pretty egalitarian because, well, if your husband is sleeping, you better still know how to kayo your boat, nah. Nah, you, you, uh, So it's it's uh, and and uh, lineage is is not through the father. Uh, quite often, it's through the mother as well. Um, uh, passing of possession, right? The warisan, what you get after the death, uh, is. Also through the daughters as well, so it's not just a. It is is a lot more egalitarian than most uh, Malay societies. Yeah, so that's what that's what I know. Yeah, I I, I totally agree with you. I, I always believe that you know the women are the backbone of the family because they know whatever the males can do, they can actually do the same or even better. And at the same time, they cook. They make sure that the household being kept alive, right? Um, so a lot of the traditions are being passed down through my mother, um, and and I don't know whatever she knows, um, it, she learned directly from my grandfather as well. And of course, she, because she also um, takes care of the household, because her being um, one of the older women in a family of you know twelve. Um, and I think my grandmother also, when I remember very vividly our boat, we, 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 um, it was actually broken down, the engine was broken down. She basically kiao or row all the way back to Pasir Panjang and it took her one hour um, just rowing and rowing and rowing. And so that's a kind of like image I had about you know the Orang Pulau community, the women of Orang Pulau community, they are really strong. Okay, um, well I think we'll go down to the last two questions. The next question, I'm going to combine it actually. Would the different Orang Pulau visit each other on their islands? Uh, what was the relationship like between the different islanders? And uh, would the cultures of the northern islands such as Ubin and Tekong be similar or different to those of the, the southern islands? I'll take the one on the Ubin and Tekong first. Okay, I'll, I, I think I'll take one on the first one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think f um, the kind of relationship that we have with southern islands, definitely we, it's a very communal space, right? The sea is a communal space. Um, we would visit each other. There are intermarriages between different islands. You know, or kita orang Sekeng kawin dengan orang Semakau. You know, or um, orang Sudong kawin dengan orang Singapura, etc. So there's always inter intermarriages, and and they would shift. Uh, do you call it suku? But I think uh, pulau lah. They shift pulau. You know, um, and also because of like uh, displacement, right? Bukom were the first to be displaced, and a lot of them actually moved to the different islands. For example, Pulau Semakau, um, and and Pulau Sekeng. And of course, the Riau Islanders would actually come visit us really often um, when you know the maritime laws were not in place. Um, Riau, because it's really a big communal space, they would come, you know, harbour gifts um, coming from you know a, a few kilometers away, and um, in return we will give them baguettes, for example, um, because they cannot find bread on on the, the the islands in Riau. So things like that were actually very apparent back then. Um, yeah, like what Fidao said, there was marriages between the islands. So um, also for cemeteries, um, so for Baranians, some of them were actually um, buried in Sentosa. Yeah, um, and then also for schools, there are some other islands who actually islanders who actually came to school in um, Pulau Brani. Uh, in terms of um, the war, right? So you had the option to actually run away. So there are some people that I know who actually took the boat back to like Moro Island, um, any any of the real islands to to stay. Yeah. Uh, Sharon, Ubin and I was just going to. Really, if you speak to even the Orang Selata now, uh, they still visit Riau Islands, uh, attend weddings, uh, funerals. So there's there's still connections uh, between the, at least the Orang Selata uh, and, and the Riau Island archipelago. 
Yeah. So definitely. What, what what about the the culture between the southern islands and the northern islands? So Tekong Uben versus Brani, for example, would it be similar kind of lifestyle, similar kind of tradition? As far as I know, the Tekong and Uben are in the domain of the Orang Selita, but of course there there will be other settlers oh, okay. coming in as well. Uh, so the Orang Selita, principally the Orang Selita, right? Their kerahan is to defend the old town, the old capital of Johor, which is Kota Tinggi. Na. So if you can just imagine the map of uh, Singapore, right? And then you have Ubin and Tekong. Uh, and and it's, it's just at the mouth of the Johor River. So that was really a strategic location for the Orang Selita. And then whoever came by uh, after that, as a kind of a defense force for for Kota Tinggi, uh, they had slightly like I mentioned earlier, they have a slightly different language, uh, the Orang Selita compared to the Southern Islanders, but that did not uh, stop them from uh, going over intermarrying. Uh, but of course, in the past, uh, you had to wait, uh, you had to wait for the monsoons to to be favorable even to to come down to the Southern Islands. Either that or you have to walk through Singapore, which they, they don't like. La. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, last question. This one is, uh, there's some interest in um, the publications. So, first question is for Izian. Where can I buy the book on Brani Memories of an Island? Second question is for Fidaus. Will there a book be a book on Pulau Semakau, compiling pictures and narratives from the island that's coming soon? Very easy, yes. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. working on <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. Izian, your book, how? It's currently out of stock. Um, I will talk to NLB about it, no promises. Um, I would like to invite you to like the Memories of Pulau Brani Facebook page. Just search Memories of Pulau Brani. You can converse with the islanders, they are very vocal on the Facebook page. Um, I can also send you the PDF copy if you are willing to accept that version. Um, and eventually I will also put up the longer versions of the videos that you saw of the interviews with the islanders on the Facebook page also. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've, we've taken 15 minutes longer, uh, but thank you so much for your sharing and thank you everyone for your interest and your question. I w I'm sorry that we cannot go through all of them. It'll probably take until five. There, there's, there were still questions <laughs> coming in. Uh, so thank you for your questions. I uh, apologize again. Um, anyway, you're in the gallery now. There's actually a gallery on Kehidupan Laut. If you've not been here before, do check it out. There's some objects related to maritime life as well as uh, some artifacts uh, related to the Orang Pulau and Orang Laut and photos as well. Uh, while you're here, if you have time, please do check out our special exhibition, Cerita. Uh, it's going to be running until July 31st. But before you go, um, this is, is this it? Oh no. Yeah, this is a feedback QR code. So do give us your feedback. Your feedback is very important to us to make sure that we can continue doing what we're doing, telling us whether we're doing a good job, where we can improve, etc. And um, <coughs> yeah, so we look forward to having you here again. Uh, do join us on our Facebook or on our Instagram to know our upcoming programs. Uh, we have a whole array of programs coming up for you in, rela in relation to Charita's special exhibition. And have a good weekend. Thank you very much.